All right. Welcome to the Norwalk Free Will Baptist Church. We're having a little bit of technical difficulty, so we're a little, little late. This newer version is kind of killing me, so we went back to the old version. Um, Jordan's here. Hi, Jordan. Okay. We're going to give everybody a chance to, to log in. And we welcome you to our fine artwork on the walls. Amen. In case you get bored, they're going to just randomly upgrade because, you know, we live in a day where, you know, we don't have a whole lot of attention span. So give you moving things to help you uh, stay focused. All right. So, so far, Jordan's on. But uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I know that, you know, some people may be essential in working. I'm not essential, but I guess I'm still working. Um, and uh, some people are, you know, uh, probably thinking it's 7 o'clock or whatever. But uh, anyway, let's go ahead and get started because this can stay live or this can stay on Facebook as, you know, as long as we need it to. And everybody may get a chance to watch it. But, uh, you know, tonight what I was thinking about is here we are. Um, you know, we're in the middle of Holy Week, and what does what does Holy Week mean? Where do we, you know, what do we do, and and you know, what's the timelines and all this other stuff? So Sunday, I started really looking at the timelines of, of Holy Week, and so that's kind of where we're at now. And uh, uh, this is the Wednesday uh, before uh, the crucifixion. Uh, it's the Wednesday before the Passover feast, and in the uh, uh, Jesus and the disciples um, having their their meal in the upper room. And so, you know, as I was looking at it, Matthew chapter 26, uh, we're going to look at the first probably 16 verses. So uh, if you give you a ch chance to get your Bibles over to the Ma book of Matthew in chapter 26, and we're going to start in verse 1. And, and this is pretty much the Wednesday before uh, leading up to the cross. And so in Matthew chapter 26, uh, it says, and it came to pass that when Jesus uh, had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, you know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest, uh, who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that they may take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. Now, when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box and a very precious ointment, and poured it on his head, and, and he sat at meat, as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment may have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured out this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, uh, this that this woman hath done be told for a memorial of her. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, uh, went into the chief priests, and he said unto them, What will you give me, and I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver, and from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you again, Lord, for your, your goodness and your mercy. And Lord, that uh, uh, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Lord, I pray that during this holy week where we're... Uh, sheltered in place where uh, we have time on our hands that we would really dig deep and and learn more of you and lord i just pray now that uh, as the message is preached tonight uh, lord that you would meet with us in a great way lord uh, be in every home uh, you have promised where two or three are gathered together there them and so lord i just pray that uh, uh, you would just uh, uh, lord freely speak uh, to our hearts and lives and lord we just pray now that as this message goes forward that it'll be your words that are spoken Lord, that we might be able to glorify and honor, honor you. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. It's Wednesday of Holy Week. And, you know, I started thinking, 
you know, we, we like to think we're in control. Um, but, you know, we soon find out that our desires, our plans, um, everything that we can do can be changed by others uh, in a blink of an eye. Uh, circumstances of life, different kinds of things. And so, you know, really when you think about it, man has some limited success in really manipulating other people or even planning for the future. Uh, all this will be seen as we examine how different uh, people here in this passage of, uh, of, of Scripture uh, as, as we contemplate how people prepared for the death of Christ. And so there's, there's four points I'd like to make regarding these verses, uh, the Wednesday before this, the, the crucifixion. And the first one, and, and probably the most important one that I think we really, really have to focus on is the fact that uh, in Matthew chapter 26, verses 1 and 2, it says, And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings that he said unto his disciples, You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. And so as we look at this, the, the points I want to make are, one, first of all, um, verse 1 tells us the timing. And Jesus says uh, this after finishing his Olivet Discourse. And now uh, in verse two, he shows that, you know what, what's going to happen is not a surprise. It's not coming to Jesus as a surprise. And so, you know, as we look at that, I think it's very important because one of the most important things that I think we need to really take away from Holy Week is that it is God's sovereign plan. It's God's sovereign plan. God has been, uh, Jesus has been telling the disciples about this since chapter 16, when Jesus began his journey to Jerusalem to be crucified. In Matthew chapter 16, in verses 21 and 22, it says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that uh, he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and, and be killed, and be raised again the third day, and then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, Peter, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But, you know, it's interesting because Jesus warned them several more times while they were on their way to Jerusalem what was going to occur when they got there. You know, he had told them the same thing in Matthew chapter 17, uh, verse 22 and verse 23. After Jesus and Peter and James and John returned uh, from the mountain in which Jesus was transfigured before them, in, in verse 22 it says, And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceedingly sorry. So Jesus isn't hiding anything. Jesus isn't, you know, trying to, uh, you know, hide anything. It's it, 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 He's telling them exactly what's going to happen. You know, uh, later, uh, as Jesus approaches Jericho, the last city before Jerusalem, uh, Jesus tells the disciples again in Matthew 20 and verse 18 and 19, it says, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be, be betrayed under the chief priests and under the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. Jesus also hinted about the coming crucifixion uh, in John chapter 2 and verse 19 uh, when he told them uh, those people that were seeking a sign, you know, trying to, to uh, uh, seeking a sign, uh, you know, they wanted some kind of miracle or whatever. And, and Jesus, remember, he alluded to the fact that he was going to suffer and bleed and die on the cross when he said, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise, raise it up. And, you know, it, it's, the text goes on to specifically uh, state that Jesus was actually talking about his physical body. And so as we look at these passages of scriptures tonight, I, I, I truly want us to look and to see and to know and to feel and, and to really take it to heart that what's happening this week is not an accident. It's not a fluke. It's not something weird. You know, the, the, the mean old nasty people aren't here trying to d destroy Jesus and, and Jesus is a helpless victim. Listen, this is the way it is. This is God's sovereign plan. Now, as we go on, you know, I think it's important that we see that um, 
what's going to occur in, in the next two days truly, truly isn't a surprise. When you start having to deal with who is Jesus, who is God, right? I, I think when you look at Jesus, when you look at him versus all the other religious figures, uh, there's some things that really you have to take into account. Jesus had no control over where he's born, and Jesus really has no control over where he's going to die because it's God's sovereign plan. You know, back in the 22nd Psalm, David uh, prophetically speaks uh, about what would occur to Jesus uh, during this time. He says, uh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And I'm going to kind of paraphrase, but kind of, uh, you know, give it to you. But my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That was verse one. But I am a worm and not a man, a, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They, they separate with the lip and they wag the head saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. And then he says, they pierce my hands and my feet. I count all my bones. They look, they, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. And, you know, that was way before what we're seeing here in Jerusalem this day. You know, Isaiah described the Messiah as the suffering servant, describing in detail what Jesus was going to go through sometime 700 years later. It's not a mistake, and it's not something that's catching God by surprise. Before the foundations of the world, this was put into place. The time, the place, the participants, the day, everything was planned out. This is God's plan, and it's a perfect plan for God to be able to redeem man, lost man, sinful man, back to himself. Now, listen, this, this evening, I don't know where you're at. I don't know how you're feeling. I don't know what you're going through, but you know what? You might be going through some things. Uh, maybe you're shocked. You, you can't control it. Uh, the situation you find yourself in, no matter, no matter what you do, you, you feel helpless, right? Let me, let me share with you that God's got this. He's not surprised. He's got a plan and, and he's in control and he's got a plan for your life. If you look at this passage of scripture and you really, really digest it, what, one of the things you see is that from the foundations of the world, God made a way for lost, sinful man to be bought back to him. And it didn't happen on a whim, and it didn't happen by accident. Jesus didn't trip over it on his way to Jerusalem. But the question is, will you let him control your life? See, Jesus is our Savior and Lord now because he allowed Lord God uh, to control his life. He yielded himself to the Lord. When he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and, he, and, he, and he's praying and great sweat, uh, 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 blood is, is, is pouring out of his pores and he's sweating blood and he's, uh, he's asking the Lord, he's telling the Lord, not my will, but thine be done. If this can pass from me, if there's any other way, this is the plan, I get it. But if there's any other way, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not thy will or not my will, but thine be done. And the question is, listen, God's in control. He's got a plan for your life. But are you letting him control your life? Are you submitting to his plan for your life? You know, it's interesting because uh, uh, earlier I said something about Peter, right? And uh, Peter is a paradox. Uh, Peter's a fascinating character to study. And I... I say Peter, and then I always have to say, oh, Peter, right? Remember back earlier when, when Jesus asked the disciples, and he said, uh, whom do men say that I am? And they're like, oh, some say you're a prophet, some say you're John, whatever, right? And then Peter steps up in his brash, you know, kind of like, hey, uh, and he says, you're the Messiah, you're the Christ. And remember, Jesus is like, you're right. And, and the Spirit is what told you that. That's not something that you connected the dots with in your brain, Peter, Mr. Mouthy Mouth, but that's something that the Spirit has shown you, right? And, and so now Peter gets his gold star. Peter's like, you know, he's feeling pretty good. Like, wow, I got the answer right. I'm, you know, this is fantastic. And then notice, not too very long after that, he goes from being 
Super Mr. Awesome Gold Star to rebuking Jesus. Now, rebuking Jesus isn't the smartest thing to do, amen? Listen, God is God, and you're not, and to rebuke God is not a good thing. See, God has a plan. This is God's sovereign plan. This is God's thing that he's going to do. And when Jesus says, hey, listen, you know what? I'm going to be, I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to suffer and bleed and die for your sins. Peter says, never, Lord, never. It's not going to happen. We won't let it happen. But you know, it wasn't very long from rebuking Jesus. No, Jesus, you're wrong. Uh, this is not the way it's going to happen. I don't care if God has a plan. I don't see it. I, this, isn't, this isn't the plan. But it wasn't very long after that he denied Jesus. Right? Jesus even knows. This is the level of the plan of God, the sovereign plan of God. Jesus even knows that his disciples won't be at the cross. He's seen it. He's been there already. He knows. He knows how this is going to unfold. See, Jesus knows what's coming all the way to the cross and even after. So what does what does Holy Week teach me? Well, you know what it teaches me that God's got a sovereign plan to buy me back. God had a sovereign plan from the very beginning to be able to pay a price so heavy and, and so 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 expensive that none of us could do it. It would take the only begotten of God to be able to come down, be made in the fashion of a man, to live a sinless life, to offer his life on the cross shed his precious blood for our sins. And that was God's plan. Now think about it for just a second. That's how important you are. That's how important you are. It wasn't an accident. It was a plan. And it was executed to perfection. It wasn't a fluke. It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't happenstance. God's plan was that Jesus would die on the cross for your sin and be raised on the third day. You know, um, we see God's plan, right? That God has a, a sovereign plan. And, and, you know, praise the Lord, because without that plan, none of us could be called the children of God. But as we move on, because we're, we're going through all of these verses to, to make some, some comparison, right? God has a plan, but these priests have a plot. Matthew chapter 26, again, verses 3 and 5, just scroll down a little bit more. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people into the place of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But they said, oh, this, hopefully this is thick. Hopefully I can do this justice. But then they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. You know, Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9 says, A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. We can make all the plans that we want in our heart. We can have all the, make up all of our, you know, kind of how we think that things are going to happen, but the Lord directs the steps. That's, that's amazing. You know, I think in my life at times, you know, I have an idea, I have a plan, I have what I think is going to happen and, and all of that. And then, bam, the Lord shuts the door or bam, something else happens or, or bam, another door opens up. Right. So a man can, you know, you can devise your way in your heart, but God's going to direct the steps. And, and this is fascinating to me because the chief priests and the elders and the scribes and the Pharisees, they should have learned a long time before this that they're not in control. Amen. He said, well, what do you mean? Well, they've been plotting the death of Jesus since chapter 12. Remember, but the Pharisees went out and counseled together against him as how uh, they might destroy him. They're already, they're already moved to destroy Jesus. They're already moved to, to kill Jesus, right? And now, here they come. Their sinister plot is afoot. Now, John chapter 5. So, so I want you to see something because there's been a multiple attempts. There's been multiple thoughts. There's been multiple, hey, we've got to kill Jesus, right? This isn't the first time that these, these Pharisees and these scribes and these hypocrites and these religious leaders, you know, hey, we got to get Jesus out of here, man, because he is really making a mess for us 
we got a cush thing going, and he's really messing it up for us. In John chapter 5, right, uh, only a few weeks after the previous one, it, it, the healing of Bethesda uh, or Bethsaida, in which Jesus also forgave the sons of the crippled man, and, and, and the religious, uh, the Jewish religious response, right, in verse 18 was seeking all the more to kill him because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but also calling God his father and making himself equal with God. And, and these, these, these judgmental Pharisee religious nut jobs decide they want to kill Jesus and use their religiousness. I don't know. It's six o'clock and my brain hurts. Trying to, trying to use the religiousness to justify. It's not about, it's not about them and their passion for the Lord and, and doing things that are right. Their, their passion is about, hey, we got to get rid of Jesus because he's not letting us do what we want. He's not letting us have the control that we want. He's not letting us have the power that we want. And in Luke 4, they did try to kill Jesus. The angry crowd wanted to throw him off a cliff on the edge of Nazareth. And, and, and Jesus let them get him to the edge of that cliff. But then passing through the midst, he went his way. So God's got a plan. And the, police, or the priests have a plot. In John chapter 8, in verse 59, they picked up rocks to stone Jesus. But Jesus hid himself. And, and went out of the temple. That's interesting because how do you walk out of this? How do you how do you hide yourself in the midst of a crowd that wants to kill you? Some would say God's sovereignty, God's plan. Amen. They had ample opportunity and they tried to kill Jesus. But you know what? They could not kill Jesus prior to God's predetermined time because God has a sovereign plan. Man, if you don't get anything out of this tonight, anything, and you're going to say, hey, wow, that was like one of the worst messages I've ever heard. Take this to, to heart. God had a sovereign plan, and it came to fruition because God is in control. Amen? Now, as we look at verse 3 and 5, we find out they couldn't delay his murder at their own hands, even, right? So they try to kill him. They can't kill him. And now they decide, all right, we're going to kill him. And then they try to say, hey, what time are we going to kill him? We can't kill him on the feast day. We can't do it during the festival because if we do that, uh, there, might be a, there might be a riot. And the people would go up in arms against us. And we, we really don't need the people against us. You see something here? These, these people are more afraid of people, more afraid of people than they are of God. I mean, it sounds stupid. Who does that? But then I, I think, and, you know, there's probably a lot of people that are more afraid of people than they are of God. Just going to float that out there for a second. They let people control what they want to do. They, can, they let people control what they think about God. They let people, they're so afraid that people are not going to like them or, or, or people are going to be mean to them or whatever it is that they are more afraid of people than they are of God. You know what? Here's the issue. Here's the thing. Here's the truth, right? They don't have the power to determine when Jesus is going to die, even though the murder is going to be done at their hands. It's going to be on their heads. They still cannot determine the day, the time, or the hour that it happens. God does that because God is control. God said that Jesus would die on the most important day of the festival, the festival, the Passover itself. Then bless God, Jesus is going to die on the most important day of the festival on Passover itself. You know, it's not... It's not rocket scientists. It's not hidden. It's not super deep. Why? Because remember back in the Old Testament, the Passover, where they put the blood over the doorposts, right? Because the death angel was coming. And they, if, if they saw the, you know, if the angel of the Lord saw the blood applied, then death would pass by your house. And it was a Passover. And why? I mean, how perfect, how perfect 
that Jesus is going to bleed and suffer and die. And that blood would be applied to our lives so that the judgment of God would pass over us. It, it's, it's thick. It's beautiful. It's awesome. It's God's perfect plan. So we have God's plan. We have the priest's plot. But the other one I want to see, and as we contrast here, is the woman's pricey and pure worship, right? A woman, we, we know her as Mary of Bethany, right? Came to him with an alabaster vial of costly perfume, and she poured it on his head as he, as he reclined at the table. Mary's act is one of pure, absolute worship, a heart of adoration, right? And listen, a heart of adoration is not concerned with price or, or economy or restraint. It desires to give everything that it possibly can. When we have that kind of worship and we have that kind of heart, you know what? It's not going to be about all the external things that, that seem to be important to us. It's going to be, I want to give everything, the most valuable parts. I want to give the best that I have to Jesus. Now, she had 12 ounces or, or a Roman pound of pure nard. Not only did she put it on Jesus' head and, and his beard, and, but she also used it to anoint his feet. You know, as, as I looked at this and I was looking for nuances, you know, the Bible is very clear. Mark chapter 14, verse 3 makes it clear that she didn't just pour a little bit on Jesus. His head, his shoulders, his feet, you know, it's pretty expensive stuff, man. I got to use it sparingly. He doesn't need all of this. But I'm, I'm going to use a little bit, and then we'll just get that in there. Can you work it in, Jesus? Just work it in a little bit. Um, you know, it's kind of expensive stuff. It's not what happened. She didn't just pour a little bit out. She broke the vial. You know what? She's, she let its contents pour all over his body. She broke that vial. There's no going back. There's no going back. She's using it all for the glory of God. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? This lady's pricey worship, it's, it's crazy. You know, a true worshiper, you know, I was looking at this, you know, I was thinking about this. A true worshiper gives freely without concern for the cost. Because really, let's be honest, right? Really, honestly, it's, it's a trifle compared to what's been received from God, right? See, a lot of times we, we approach God with this idea, this thought of, well, how much is it going to cost me? How much time am I going to have to spend? How much time am I going to lose? How much time, you know, what's the investment? What kind of you know, effort do you want from me? Listen, whatever it costs, it came from God to start with. And, 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 you know, nothing can be lost when it's used to worship the Lord. You know, I, I think about, Oh, the Steve Jobs sometimes, you know, we talk about him every once in a while. And kind of a nut job, you know, richest man in the world at one time or whatever, you know, and all of that. And he, did, he died. He died. All of his money, all of his fame, all of his prestige, all of his cars, houses, whatever it was, stock options, everything he had. He could not buy his health. You know, I, I truly, truly, truly wish that Steve Jobs could could meet with us post grave. I, I really do, because he, he would tell us this one thing that's absolutely true, and I know it's true, right? I would give everything I had. I would give everything I had to do it over again. To do it over again. Every penny, every cent, every car, every house, every stock option. I would give everything. See, God gives us the health. God gives us our time. God gives us everything that he gives our breath. He gives everything that we need. Now, we can go on about the disciples and, you know, how wrong they were uh, in, in this situation, right? Because we know Jesus corrects them. I, I want to focus on that, right? I, I want to focus on that part because a lot of people go negative and they're like, oh, yeah, look, you know, not, Jesus, Jesus corrected them, right? You can read that for yourself. I want to focus on this. Mary may or may not have understood 
that her act was in preparation for Jesus's burial. Now, the text doesn't explicitly say that, but think about it for a minute. She did understand. I, I truly believe that she did understand what was going on because unlike the other people in that day, she paid very close attention to what Jesus said. That's why we find her in Luke chapter 10, sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening, worshiping, the better part. Everybody else around is like, hey, how come she's sitting there listening to you, man? We got tables to wait. We got things to do. You know, the disciples throughout their whole walk with the Lord, it's like, all right, I got to figure out this. I got to figure out that. Oh, Lord, now, no, 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 it's not going to happen like that. You're the Lord. It's Don't worry. And even though Jesus over and over and over and over again tells them that he is going to die in Jerusalem on the Passover and he was going to raise again or rise again on the third day. Oh, now, now. But we got a lady here that sat at Jesus' feet and, and she so wanted to have that fellowship with God. She so wanted to worship the Lord. She so wanted to hear his wisdom that she listened. I suspect she understood what the disciples kept missing and, and that her anointing Jesus with the nard it was a response of her heart in pure, adoring worship for the one that was going to die in her place. You know, I've always heard this, and, you know, I, I like to believe it. And hopefully I don't tear up and cry like a little baby. But, you know, it, it really touches me when I think about And I don't know where I heard it. I would give them credit. But it was an illustration or something that I heard at one time about how, you know, six days before the cross, she she – she anointed Jesus. And, you know, those times were the hardest for him. It was hard for him to, to go forward. It was hard for him because he was 100% God, but he's 100% man, and he's tempted in all points as we are, but without sin. And, and you know, he's, he's coming to grips with it in the Garden of Gethsemane, and I think he, he started smelling that. He started smelling the, the nard that was, was, was broken out of that vessel and poured all over his face and his beard and, and his feet. And I think that he kept walking and, you know, as he was carrying his cross down the, uh, the the road there that he may have thought about it. I don't know. I'm not saying he did because that, we don't have any, any kind of indication in the Bible that he, he did. But I like to think this, that, you know what, he's like, you know what, this isn't going to happen. These people that I created are going to destroy me and treat me like this and spit on me and do all of this. I don't think so. It's about time to call 10,000 angels from heaven and take care of this mess, but he sniffed a little bit, and he, and he smelt that, that ointment. And he said, you know what? If I don't do this, if I don't follow through with this sovereign plan of God, then Mary's not going to have a Savior. She's not going to be able to be redeemed. She's not going to be able to go to heaven and have a relationship with my Father. And he probably started looking around, and neither is that guy, and neither is that guy, or neither is that guy, or neither is that thief on the cross. And, and he started probably looking down through time, and he said, you know what, and, and neither will James or Leah or, or, or Brother Vilness or Jordan or Josh or anybody else. I have to do it. She might have worshipped him to the point where she helped perpetuate it. I don't know. Why do you know this? He is worth our worship and our praise. And if it costs everything, then that's fine because that's what he, he invested everything. It cost him everything to save us. Now, a question comes and people ask, you know, what, what does this story happen here? Because, you know, um, it should be back in chapter 20. Chronologically, it should be back in chapter 20. But remember that Matthew's emphasis is presenting Jesus as the Messiah and explaining his kingdom program, right? Jesus' death is part of that program. Mary's act is in preparation for his death. And so it fits the context uh, here as a reminder that Jesus had previously been declaring that his death was coming, and at least one person understood it. It also sets the extreme contrast to, to Judas' wicked acts. There's four things happening in this passage of Scripture the Wednesday before the gospel. And we come to the final one, this pitiful sellout. Now, I don't like giving Judas too much time 
we're not going to give him too much time. Judas is a sellout. To have walked and talked with the Lord, to have seen miracle after miracle, to learn at the master's feet and then turn his, his back on the light of the world and walk into darkness, that's a shame. It's a shame. It's disgusting. But you know what? It happens. And it's just, it's sad. It's, it's too bad. He has Judas, his money, his greed, his hunger for power and control. 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver is what he sold the king of kings and the Lord of lords out for. 30 pieces of silver. Now, if you go to Exodus chapter 21 and verse 30, you, you'd find out that the price of a slave that had been gored by an ox is 30 pieces of silver. For the price of an injured slave, Judas sold his soul to the devil. And he became the most tragic person in the history of the world. What a contrast between Judas and Mary. Mary gave to Jesus what was probably her most valuable possession, expecting nothing in return. I had nothing in return. I, this is, Lord, I, I want to bless you. I want to worship you and and lord you're worthy of everything i have in this house but this is the most important thing this is the most expensive thing this is the best that i have to bring you and she gave it to jesus expecting nothing in return jesus was worthy of her praise jesus was worthy of her best and that's what she did and that's why she did it judas had expectations of what he could get and then being disappointed when he doesn't think that he's going to get all the stuff that he thinks he deserves by following Jesus. You know, I could almost preach this for another 35 minutes. When he didn't get, when he's disappointed by, uh, well, I'm following Jesus and I'm not getting all the things that I think I'm due. He sells Jesus out and he settles for what he could get. And it's sad because I wonder this Wednesday before Easter, this Wednesday of Holy Week, I wonder how many people are selling Jesus out for what they can get because they were following him for a time, but they didn't really get what they wanted. It's a thought. It's just something to, it's just something to think about. Now, as we, we come to a conclusion, I told you I didn't want to stay on Judas very long because I, I, don't, I don't like to give that negativity bad press or any press right at all what i want us to focus on are the two really the two most important things jesus's death is no accident it's not tragic fate it's the perfect plan of god to redeem fallen man and sometimes when things happen to us we have to understand that it's not just dumb luck it's just not bad luck it's not you know some would say luck is the religion of fools this isn't tragic fate. This is the perfect plan of God to redeem fallen man. And then the question comes to us, right? What, what is our response? Right? Do, do we rest and, and trust in God's sovereignty like Jesus did? Or do we plan against it and plot against it as these Jewish leaders did? More afraid of people than they are of the Lord, refusing to bow to the Lord, refusing to accept his lordship and his sovereignty, because you know what? They've got an agenda. And they're more afraid of what people think than, than what the Lord thinks. And they like it kind of cush. They like it having control, and they like power. Unless you give that up to the Lord and you get into his plan and you rest and trust in his sovereignty like Jesus did, my friend, I'm telling you right now, you got no hope. I think Adrian Rogers would say something like, you, you got, I wouldn't give two hoots for your hope in heaven or something like that. Then the next thing, so do you rest? Let's, let's recap. Do you rest and trust in God's sovereignty like Jesus did? Do you plot against him like the Jewish leaders did? Or do you worship the Lord with the adoration and the sacrifice like Mary did? Man, I tell you what, we're talking about this weirdness that we're living in right now, and everybody's stuck at home, and 
you know, all of this stuff and crazy and what's going to happen when the churches get reopened and all this other stuff. I think those people that have determined in their heart, have determined in their soul, in their mind, that I'm going to come back, I'm going to worship the Lord with the adoration and the sacrifice of Mary. Jesus means something to me. I, You know what? The church means something to me. I, I, I just want to, I, I want to worship and serve the Lord. I think we're going to have revived. But I also think, there may be some people out there, and, and I fear that those people will hear the word of life, and and then they'll just turn their backs like Judas did, and and sell out Jesus for for convenience or money or fame or stuff, trash. You know, it's my prayer that each of us learn to rest in the Father as Jesus did, and offer a heart of worship like Mary did, because. That's how you get peace. That's how you get satisfaction. That's how you get uh, all the good things. I don't even know where to go from there. Jesus is, or Jordan's looking at me right now, and she's like, man, say, say something else, Dad. And I'm like, I got nothing. But this Holy Week, it's weird for us. But God's still in control. God still got a plan. And I want to close with this. I want, I want you to think about this. Uh, I was talking to Dr. Mark in Bakersfield today, and, and uh, I appreciate our, our time on the phone and our opportunities to, to visit and, and to kind of bounce off of each other and do those kind of things and iron sharpening iron and all of that. And You know, we we're talking, and one of the things that I truly believe, I really do, I, I believe God is in control. But during this time, this weird, wonky time that we're in, we got to be looking for the blessings. We got to be really, really, really looking for the handiwork of God because there's things going on that we're not paying attention to. And then I started thinking, it's kind of like Mary. Mary just sat at the feet of Jesus and she worshiped the Lord. Because she did that, she listened, she saw, she understood. And you know, with us being st stuck at home and having time to, have some quietness and some rest. We can hear from God. Uh, we can focus on things. Uh, we can get our eyes off the distractions of this world. There's no, there's no sports. There's no, nothing really going on. We have such an opportunity to worship at the feet of Jesus and to see. When all this is said and done, when it's all over with, what did God have in this for us? And are we taking advantage of it? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you again for this opportunity, Lord, for the ability to, Lord, for to hear your word. And Lord, we're just so thankful that you had a plan and that you still have a plan. Our Lord, that our plan for salvation was accomplished by Jesus on the cross. And Lord, no matter how many people tried to thwart that plan, it was a perfect plan and it was a sovereign plan and you saw it through. Lord, I just pray that each and every one of us tonight that heard this word would understand that you're still on the throne. You still got a plan. You still got power. You still make things happen. And Lord, we just need to look to you, that author and finisher of our faith. And Lord, help us to have a heart like Mary, that we're willing to give it all to sacrifice, to worship you at your feet and to hear from you. And Lord, we love you and we praise you and we thank you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I thank you for your time tonight, um, and uh, you know what? I pray blessings on uh, on everything that, that's going on right now, on everybody. Um, this, When we come out of this, this is going to be a pretty, pretty interesting time, and I, I just can't wait to see what God's going to do through all of this. So be blessed, and we'll see you next time, maybe early in the morning for a Norwalk Nugget. Amen? Jordan's like, great. That cuts into my coffee time. No, she doesn't. I'm teasing. All right. Good night.